Hey guys, welcome back. Today I will show you how to estimate a confidence interval and a forecast interval in Stata. And I will estimate these intervals within the context of recent forecasts for GDP growth in the US in 2021. Some recent forecasts were made of for GDP growth that were above 6%. I'd like to show you that a GDP growth value greater than 6% is actually outside of a 99% forecast interval. And even if we assume that the recession in 2020 didn't take place, a forecast of greater than 6.18% growth is outside of a 99% forecast interval. I will show you how to create these forecast intervals in Stata, along with confidence intervals and the point estimates for the forecasts. First, consider the recent press conference from President Joe Biden. He mentioned, since the American Rescue Plan was passed, a majority of economic forecasters have significantly increased their projections on the economic growth that's going to take place this year. They're now projecting that it will exceed 6%. And these forecasters are specifically citing Biden's $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief bill, which he signed on March 11th. Who are these forecasters? These are economic forecasters at Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs lifts U.S. GDP forecast to 6.6% in 2021 on Biden's $1.9 trillion stimulus package. And from CNN Business, Morgan Stanley is even more bullish, predicting 7.3% growth. That would surpass the Chinese government's humble target of 6%. Today, I would like to show that GDP growth greater than 6% or even greater than roughly 6.18% is an outlier. And I will show this by estimating a forecast interval. First, here's my program code on the right. You can follow the links in the description to download this program code and the data. Now the data is from the IMF. We have years going from 1980 to 2020. I have world GDP growth. I have US GDP growth, and I have GDP growth data for the other G7 countries. I've also included GDP growth data for China and India. Now, because these are time series, let's go ahead and set the time series indicator, year. Now, I'm going to use my previous model from the last video. You can check that out here if you click the link. This is a simple AR1 model. We have one lag of GDP growth in the US predicting GDP growth. Last year, in 2020, we experienced a recession. What will GDP growth be in the following year, in 2021? Let's forecast GDP growth following the global financial crisis to highlight some of the inaccuracies of our simple model. We're going to begin the forecast in 2010. Here we can see that in 2010, the actual GDP growth was higher than the forecast. Our AR1 model did not do a great job of predicting the recovery. Now, let's consider a forecast before the recession, as if the recession hadn't taken place. We will begin the forecast in 2008. Here we can clearly see that the recession is a negative outlier, that the recession was not expected. However, the recovery following the recession was not far off from the forecast. Therefore, we may expect the outliers in our time series to typically be these negative values, these recessions, while the recoveries may not be outliers. They may not deviate from the sample average as much as the recessions. Now, if we go back in the time series and we look at the 1980s, we do see some high GDP growth. However, in recent years, the U.S. has not experienced high GDP growth, like in the 1980s. Therefore, recessions may be outliers, but the recoveries may not be. Let's consider a histogram of GDP growth and see if we can spot the outliers. As we saw from the previous video, the distribution of U.S. GDP growth is left skewed. We have a tail to the left corresponding to the recessions in GDP. Here's an estimate of the shape of the distribution, and we can more clearly see this left tail. Now, is this a quirk of the US GDP growth series? Or can we see this left tail in other series? Let's consider the G7 countries. Here are economic growth distributions in G7 countries. We can still spot the trailing left tail and the skewness in these distributions. Let's consider the distribution of GDP growth for China and India. 
we do see a skewed distribution for India, but not as much for China. China has not experienced a recession in the 41 years of data. Now, if we consider the shape of the distribution of US GDP growth, we may expect these values in the tail to be outliers. A normal distribution has a similar bell shape, although symmetric. Here is a typical normal distribution. A normal distribution can show us typical values for our series, and the atypical values will be in the tails of the distribution. Well, we expect the average to be in the center. The average GDP growth in our sample is 2.47. X-bar denotes the sample average. Now, we have just one sample and one sample average, but we may consider many different samples of GDP growth for the US. Now, we can collect many different samples of GDP growth and try to predict the population GDP growth. The population average GDP growth you could think of as like the true underlying growth in the US. The sample average GDP growth is just a subset. Now, if we collect many samples of GDP growth, we can calculate the average of each sample. And then with the sample averages, we can create a distribution. And the distribution of sample averages should be normal. And that's because the distribution of GDP growth for the population is expected to be normal. So in theory, we have this distribution of sample averages. In the center, we expect to see the population parameter, mu, our population average GDP growth. Therefore, we may not know the population average. However, we can use our sample and estimate the population average using our sample average. Similarly, we may not know the population standard deviation. However, we know the standard deviation of sample means, and we know the sample size of our samples. Population standard deviation will be larger than the standard deviation of sample means, or the standard deviation of sample means will be smaller than the population standard deviation. This means that the distribution of sample means will be narrower than the population distribution. The standard deviation of sample means is also called the standard error of the mean. Now, because we know the shape of the distribution of sample means is normal, we can identify some useful characteristics. Because the distribution shape is normal, we can expect that 68.26% of sample means are within one standard deviation of the mean. 95.46% of the sample means are within two standard deviations or two standard errors. Finally, 99.72% of the sample means are within three standard deviations of the mean, or 99.72% of the sample means are within three standard errors. Now, in practice, we collect only one sample. I only have sample data from the IMF. With one sample mean, we can estimate a confidence interval such that we can be 95.46% confident, 99.72% confident, or we can have some degree of confidence that the population mean is between two values. After all, our sample mean may not be precisely the population mean. Here we can estimate a 99.72% confidence interval according to the three standard errors. The upper bound is X bar subscript U. The lower bound is X bar subscript L. And we simply add or subtract the three standard errors. Note that we only have one sample mean, not a distribution of sample means. We do not know the standard deviation of sample means. However, we also do not know the population standard deviation. Let's use the sample standard deviation rather than the population standard deviation. Now, let's plug in values for the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. I'm going to use the summarize command in Stata. Here's the mean of 2.470659 and the sample standard deviation of 2.100666. And note our sample size is 41. This is n. So here's the upper bound and here's the lower bound. Let's solve them out. And there we go. The upper bound sample mean statistic is 3.454, and the lower bound sample mean statistic is 1.486. In our distribution, you can think of it like this. The lower bound here, the upper bound, and the center of our distribution. 
at our sample mean. Now to interpret the confidence interval, imagine that we have lots of sample means. And for each of the sample means, we can construct a confidence interval. 99.72% of the confidence intervals will contain the population mean. However, again, in practice, we just have one sample mean. Now, the confidence interval can also give us an idea of typical values in our data set. We could be wrong, and the population mean is outside of this confidence interval. And it is important to keep that in mind. Now, this confidence interval we can estimate in Stata. Let's go ahead and do that. The command is CI. We should specify means. You can specify either means or proportions. Here, the average is a mean, it's not a proportion. The variable is US growth, and I'm specifying the confidence interval for three standard deviations. And here we go. Standard error is 0 0.328069. Our mean is 2.470659 with 41 observations. And here's the 99.72% confidence interval. So the question is, what is typical growth one year after a recession? Is it a positive outlier? Following the global financial crisis, it was not a positive outlier. Following a small recession in the 1990s, it was not a positive outlier. Or at least it's close to being within three standard errors of the mean. Now the growth following the recession is within three standard errors. However, this is a confidence interval. It's for our sample. Our forecasts are out of sample. Therefore, we must create a forecast interval. And importantly, the standard errors are changing over time. Let's generate forecasts and forecast intervals with standard errors that increase over time within the forecast horizon. Consider this website from otexts.com. For a multi-step prediction interval, the further ahead we forecast, the more uncertainty is associated with the forecast, and thus the wider the prediction intervals. Therefore, let's generate a naive forecast and a drift forecast. We're going to estimate the standard deviation of the H step forecast distribution. For the naive forecast, the standard deviation of the H step forecast changes by the standard deviation of the residuals times the square root of H. H is the number of steps. For the drift forecast, the standard deviation changes by this residual standard deviation times the square root of H times one plus H over T. T is the number of years in our sample. So first we predict the residuals. The variable E represents the residuals from this regression. We're going to add five extra years. Then we forecast using the naive method for multi-step forecasts. Here we can see our forecast, the lower forecast bound, the upper forecast bound, and we can see that the 6% forecast for 2021 is outside of our forecast interval. And this is a 99% forecast interval. Remember that we need this variable H, which changes by one for each step into the forecast. Here's the formula for the drift method of sta calculating standard errors. And here's the upper bound and the lower bound for the forecast interval. Note that this is for a 99% forecast interval rather than 99.72%. So rather than three, we have 2.575 for the 99% interval. Now you may notice that the forecast begins following the recession. We're forecasting a recovery and that's difficult. Let's forecast as if the recession hadn't occurred. The recovery may be close to our forecast, like in the previous example from the global financial crisis. When you run this code, the forecast begins in 2020 as if there was no recession. This forecast may be closer to the actual value of GDP growth in 2021. Let's see the value for the upper bound of our forecast interval. The upper bound of our forecast interval is 6.18, with our forecast as if the 2020 recession didn't happen. Now, even if the recession did not happen in 2020, we would not expect to see GDP growth above 6.18% for 2021. Now, we may point to other evidence that suggests GDP growth will not be above 6.18% in 2021. For one, the civilian unemployment rate. For March of 2021, it was 6%. Before the pandemic and before the recession, the unemployment rate was 3.5%. Also, 
consider China's GDP growth target. Their target is above 6%. However, consider China's GDP growth of the past five years. Here is China's GDP growth. And in 2020, it was 1.851%. In 2019, 6.11%. The year prior, 6.75%. And the year prior, 6.947%. Given these past values of GDP growth, I think a 6% forecast is reasonable. By comparison, consider US GDP growth. In 2020, we had the recession, but in the years prior, 2.161%, 2.997%. 2.33%. Given these past values of GDP growth, a 6% forecast or higher for 2021 does not seem likely. Now on this point of greater than 6% growth for 2021, I had the opportunity to ask Myron Scholes what he thought. I asked him if it was wrong to expect a 6% or higher GDP growth for 2021. And he mentioned that it may not be wrong to expect that. He said to look out for some things like growth in capital formation and the level of borrowing. Some good questions to ask are what investments are to be made with this borrowing and what is good debt to pay off in the future. He also mentioned that the 6% growth is likely not sustainable and even the forecasts from Goldman Sachs allude to that. Although in his presentation, he reminds us that often we look at the averages. However, he reminds us it's good to look at the tails, not just the averages in our distributions. He mentions that volatility may not necessarily be bad. There can be good volatility and bad volatility. But that will be it for today. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed. Hit the like button. We'll see you next time. Thank you guys.